You ready? Yep. I'm David Barsamian for Deep Dish TV, and I'm very pleased to welcome Hirsch Dobal, who's the executive director of the Human Rights Law Network in New Delhi, India, and he is also the editor of the bi-monthly Combat Law, a magazine that is published both in Hindi and in English. Thank you welcome, very much, David. Welcome to the program. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Well, human rights uh, in India, what kind of issues do you cover? See, uh, it's a very complex question, but if you look at India today, uh, since I work with human rights, on human rights issues, I would categorize the sources of violations that we address under three, four, maybe five categories. One is that, you know, we have this huge um, uh, anti-terror campaign so you have terrorism and anti-terrorism campaign and the laws related to that which are leading to massive uh, violations of human rights today, witch hunting of minorities, uh, uh, subjugation of tribals and Dalits uh, on a massive scale. So that's one. The second source of, and a major source of human rights violation today in India is uh, what is known as uh, left-wing, radical left-wing terrorism, the government, the state calls it terrorism. You have this, uh, these groups of uh, radical left that believe in overthrowing the state with armed rebellion. And there are many groups like that. Uh, you and know, these are sometimes called Maoists, they're called Naxalites, they're called uh, uh, miscreants, revolutionaries, they have different labels. Well, this movement in India started with the total disenchantment with the left, the mainstream left uh, in seven, early 70s from West Bengal, a village called Naxalbari. So they were known Naxals that time and over a period of time that group, you know, got divided into many other groups and subgroups. So there are a number of groups. So they are known as Maoists, as Naxals, various names, various groups. Uh, and there is, according to our own Prime Minister's statement that today, uh, 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 you know that that is the single largest threat to the security of the country that is what Indian Prime Minister stated some time back and you have you know again according to uh, government officials you have about over 30 percent of the area under uh, Naxal or Maoist influence against the influence of the violence as they say by the radical left so this is the second and then of course the state is trying to counter uh, this movement and uh, in between a number of poor farmers, tribals are being victimized. So this is the second source of uh, major violations in India. And the third source is, as you know, that we are a huge, diverse uh, country. So we have a number of groups, ethnicities, subgroups, caste, and there are a number of uh, autonomous movements, uh, movements for mm, separation in some cases, more autonomy, this would, this would be in Kashmir, Kashmir, and the northeast, the whole of northeast of India. Mm -hmm. So this is the third major source of violation that the state tries to curb this militancy or these insurgencies or these groups that are seeking to break away, seem to be breaking away from the state of India, from the Union of India, or demanding more autonomy. So this is the third source of violation. The fourth source today, which is again huge, you know. Uh, is development-induced displacement and any group of people or farmers or villagers in India, those who are opposed to these developmental projects that are leading to uh, huge loss of lives and livelihoods, impoverishment, uh, including the erosion of basic rights and labor rights. So, so the state is going with a certain model of development. We have about 38 million people that have been displaced in India by developmental projects alone since independence, which is a huge number, 38 million. So wherever people are opposed to these policies, where poor people are being turned away from their forests, from their resources, from rivers, from their land, from their orchards, uh, you know, uh, they are meeting the same fate. The state is coming down heavily upon them. But this, this um, movement, this displacement of millions of Indians, has accelerated since the early 1990s when Manmohan Singh, who is the prime minister today, was then the finance minister, and he adopted the neoliberal agenda, which uh, allowed the uh, introduction of uh, foreign capital into India, and then the building of these uh, various projects, mostly on indigenous land. So the, 
the, the crisis of displacement uh, has really accelerated <coughs> since, since the early 1990s. You're absolutely right. Uh, I come from a town in, in Himalayan uh, state of uh, Uttarakhand, part of India, where a huge dam, which was conceived, conceptualized, and, and it's, uh, the work on which it started in early 70s, and it has just been completed two years back, um, uh, my town is no more, it's underwater. People ask me, where are you from? I said, my, there's no home, there's no town. I come from there. So there was a time in 60s, 70s, until 80s, when displacement was happening. But it was, there was some logic of what they call national interest. You know, there was a huge dam coming up. It was a public sector thing. The electricity would go to offices, maybe swimming pools and big hotels in Delhi. But there was some logic of what would be called as national interest till 80s. After 90s, after what you are referring to, our uh, Prime Minister, when he became Finance Minister, and uh, after the onslaught of new liberal policies on the people of India, you have this process going multiplied. You have now private players coming. You have multinational corporations, Indian corporations, coming, eyeing an area of land, coming up with a proposal and the government is displacing people for this private profit making for the for the profit of the private capitalists. These are big corporations like Vedanta. Vedanta from England Reliance. is coming. We have Reliance in India, Ambani's. Uh, uh, Tata. And, yeah, we have Tata. And there are huge movements across India going on. If you know about the... Resisting these uh, corporate predators. All the times, if you know about uh, West Bengal, which has been ruled by the left government for the last 30 years. There also they invited these groups. One was Tata, who is a big capitalist in India, and another group was from Indonesia, Salim group. So there was huge resistance to these in these two uh, villages of West Bengal, known as one is Singur and one is Nandigram. And after that, the left has lost support in that state in local elections. So these two villages, for example, they for us they signify, uh, you know, a new uh, kind of a low in the history of left movement in India, where the left invited these groups where they were displacing people and people were resisting. I mean, you know, left has a stated objective of opposing capitalism. And you have uh, these groups coming, displacing people, you know, robbing them of their lives and livelihood support systems. And uh, the left is going to pay the price for this. So in India, it is across political spectrum now. You cannot say that the left is poor people in that sense or right is more right. So there is a, this kind of, a, you know, dangerously this political spectrum is... Uh, is basically across the political spectrum you have all the parties coming together and more or less embracing these policies. I mean displacement and development as they say is sort of this is the, the slogan that has been bought by almost all the parties in India. Now this Maoist movement that covers uh, over 200 of India's uh, 600 uh, districts uh, in what is sometimes called the Red Corridor by the Indian uh, corporate media what are their politics uh, and who do they attract other than the people who are being directly displaced? For example, are there any alliances with uh, urban elites and intellectuals, with um, labor unions and the like? This is a very interesting question. You were just referring to, uh, to the neoliberal policies in India. In 1990, we had this Maoist influence or Naxal influence, whatever you call it, in only 15 districts, 15 districts of India. And in 2008, 2010 now, it is in over 200 districts of 600 plus districts of India, which is huge, you know. So, so what, the, what accounts for that? There is a direct, there is a direct relationship, as I said before, when this movement started in 70s in India, it was basically a movement targeted against upper caste landlords, basically. And, and the major support base was coming from the Dalit. Dalits are the lowest rung in Hindu hierarchy. These are the former unt untouchables. Yeah, they were untouchable. So by and large, they were the in Bihar and West Bengal. These people would form the, the, the core support of, of Maoists or Naxals. It, after 90s, the, you have more and more tribals now. The whole of Jharkhand, quite a bit of Jharkhand. That's and a Chattis state in India. Yeah. That's a state in India. So you have these... Mao is finding more and more support among the tribals. Tribals were not the main support base of the Maoist and Naxals uh, in 70s and 80s. So there is a co-relationship. You know, we have to look at it like that. 
the 90s come neoliberal regime you know inviting investment leading to displacement looting away of resources giving away the resources that belong to the people who have lived there for many many years hundreds of years and the support base uh, of Maoists. So I doubt that this as Prime Minister is saying that this is the single largest threat and as we are saying that 33 percent of India is under this kind of influence. I doubt if these tribals who are supporting these Naxals or Maoists actually even understand what Maoism is all of them. I mean I, I doubt if they know what communist manifesto was you know uh, uh, it's a very complex. Thing. I think the basic thing is because the government is trying to push them out because they feel that there is somebody who is trying to make sense for them you know because they have lost all of their hopes in the last 15 20 years they are simply uh, supporting these, these these groups there is of course there is armed rebellion and there is Naxal violence but all the people that are supporting them I doubt if they actually understand what Naxalism is the simple fact that there is so much impoverishment so much of poverty you know, uh, they have been neglected for so long that anybody who comes and sympathizes with them and tries to resist what is happening, they would align themselves with, with them. You have a situation in India where, according to government reports again, about 70% people, around 836 million people, which is roughly 70% of Indian population, is surviving on per capita consumption of rupees 20 a day. Now rupees 20 a day is less than half a dollar. In India also you will you can buy maybe a bottle and half of water for that money in Delhi and Bombay and Calcutta. Now that is a level of uh, you know poverty in India 70 percent and this is not me or anybody else this is a government appointed planning commission appointed commission report you know that's one indication of poverty. There's another indication of poverty where you try to calculate the calories that how many calories you take per day which is required for the human body to function. So 2400 calories was way back, many years back, decades back actually, the poverty was pegged at 2400 kilocalories per day for rural India where people have to work harder, laborers, farmers, rickshaw pullers and 2100 for rural India. According to the new uh, economic analysis now that is coming out, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you, the amount of money you make in a month, you cannot consume more than 1800 calories and in India they are you know all the time they're trying to peg the poverty at lower and lower and lower rates so they're trying to reduce the number of poor through statistical jugglery and not through eliminating poverty altogether so you have a new report coming out that is suggesting that let us pick the poverty at 1800 kilocalories per day you know that is all right for a person who is sitting in the office or working on computer not for an Indian farmer or a tribal who is to dwell in the forest or uh, urban uh, laborers, city laborer, rickshaw putter in New Delhi. So you have, you know, and then there is health and education and you have, we have about 50%, 50% of Indian women and children are malnourished, you know, which is larger than the whole of Sub-Sahara put together. We have about 15% of children, 13% of children, which are severely malnourished, which means that today we know that these children are going to grow up with stunted growth, with some kind of disability, you know, we know that. We have maximum number of, you know, we are the hunger capital of the world, we have the largest number of poor people in the world. And on top of that, if the government is going with the kind of policy that we're talking about, like whatever remains for poor to support their lives and livelihoods is basically subsistence in agriculture or forest and forest produce. You know, these tribals that are becoming uh, supporting Naxals are food gatherers, most of them. They get the food. They, many of them are not even involved in agriculture. They are known as food gatherers. Now, you are trying to snatch even that part from them. You are trying to give that land away, those forests, those orchards, those rivers away from them and giving it to corporations for profit making. So, you know, this kind of deprivation, impoverishment, you know, it's kind of a low intensity warfare actually in the country going on all the times. This is becoming a fertile ground for these radical left groups, groups to recruit people and to support and, and to increase the support base. And some of those valuable minerals that exist primarily on 
uh, indigenous lands are manganese uh, iron ore, which is an essential component for making steel, bauxite, which is a, a key component in the making of uh, aluminum, and of course timber. The timber products are very, very valuable. And this uh, statistic that you uh, mentioned that India has more poor people than all of sub-Saharan Africa combined uh, really surprises a lot of people uh, in the West because the Indian government has been very successful in branding itself as a, a modern industrial state that has uh, a very uh, sophisticated infrastructure, that has more English speakers than any country in the world, uh, and is, you know, is, is a model of success. So how has New Delhi been able to project this image uh, to the West of being uh, so uh, successful and that their economic policies are really paying off? See, first of all, it works for both for the West and for the Indian elite. It is working for both. So it is just not India that is selling that image. It is also the West that is keen to buy that image and align with India or ask India to align with it uh, because India is a huge market. We have ever-growing middle class. I mean, it's one billion plus people. So we do have poor people, but the fact is that the middle class that is well-to-do and that is looking up all the times is actually huge. So you, you have this Western and corporate interest in India, so they would like to buy that. You, you have something like you're talking about India projecting itself to the West. Now, if you go to Delhi, you get off the airport. We have just inaugurated a new airport, which is world class, actually. But you just go like half a mile away from airport, 500 meters, that side, and you, you see absolute poverty, shocking, you know. It's overwhelming. You cannot believe. You will see people, kids, picking up food from garbage cans at real stations. You know, uh, if you go one kilometer away, you will find slums, mushrooming slums all over. The right now, we are hosting Commonwealth Games in Delhi. You know, it is basically trying to showcase a false sense of pride to the world that look, we can host these games of Commonwealth countries. I'm told that I don't remember the statistic actually, but a few crores or a few hundred crores are being spent only on inaugural ceremony. A crore so, is ten million dollars. Ten, yeah. So you have this whole, you know, New Delhi city being dug up and being pushed up. Who are the people who are working? I keep stopping it every roadside in Delhi, and I talk to these people all the times. Most of them are displaced people, lower caste, tribals, Muslims. Muslims, minorities, they are people who have been either displaced or for whom agriculture, small farms are no more sustainable. I mean, an average farmer in India holds, a small farmer holds two hectares of land uh, per, per farmer, whereas they're giving 400 to 600 hectares to the special economic zones now, you know, at very... Throwaway, Speci special economic yeah, zones, throwaway, SEZs. SEZs, throwaway yeah. prices. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you have, you have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nexus of politicians, bureaucrats, contractors, builders, very keen in projecting India's image. We're getting huge loans from multilateral and national agencies and banks. Uh, they are spent all over Delhi and metropolitan cities. So that is one face of India, you know, you just see, you get off the airport, you take a flyover, you get a nice car, you get into a hotel. They are trying to hide poverty, either lower the estimate of poverty through statistical manipulations or they are trying to simply hide it for this game. If you go to Delhi right now, it is very interesting. They are picking up beggars off the streets and trying to put them somewhere in some kind of homes. Uh, they have stopped, uh, you know, uh, what do you call these small time hawkers. They are trying to stop them from selling f street food, which is very cheap. For 5 rupees, you can get a small meal today, 5 rupees in dollar, I don't know how to. So you can still get some kind of rice and some curry and a poor man eats It's about it. 10 cents. It's about 10 cents. Yeah. So in, in, you still, one man can manage that. You know, laborer buys something for 5 rupees, 10 cents. He has some rice and curry and he eats. You're trying to remove them, you know. You're trying to demolish slums because slums are looking ugly. Where do these people go? The question that we should ask today is that from, in, from rural part, you're trying to remove people through developmental projects or you have adopted a pattern of agriculture, which is where small farmers are not finding it sustainable. 
where you have uh, uh, you know 150,000 farmers in last 10 years have committed suicide. You have farmers also, um, some of them dying of starvation, of course, many people, but farmers committing suicide because they are under debt. Many of them because of health reasons, many of them because they borrowed money from banks, because you are following a system which is kind of a package, you have to buy seeds and pesticides and everything. You are, you are demolishing your traditional agriculture system and, and following this new WTO-led uh, you know, regime dictated uh, uh, commercial agriculture system where small farmers are not able to sustain at all. So you have all these people with the course of time migrating to cities. In India, there is this process all the time. So you have huge, you know, massive number of people who are always on the move in India. They are migrating from villages to cities. They would build your bridges, your big buildings, your five-star hotels, your Commonwealth Games stadiums. And they would have their shanties and slums around. You have courts, Supreme Court now ordering demolition of slums. So village has gone unsustainable. They cannot live there. There is no employment. They come to cities. They are required. They work for a time period. And then suddenly they are not required. The work is over. They go to another city. Then suddenly they are not required. So what do these people do? I mean, you know, where do the people go? Do they go underground? Where do they survive? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a big question in yeah, India. I, th I think India has the largest internal displaced population uh, in the world. Uh, one of the largest, well, the single largest minority in India uh, is the Muslims. Uh, right. India is one of the largest uh, Muslim countries in the world. And again, with that external face of India from Bollywood, particularly, you know, you have uh, Shah Rukh Khan, you have Amir Khan, Saif Ali Khan, Salman Khan, Shabna, Shabana Azmi, and all these great movie stars. But what is the actual human rights uh, condition of for the majority of the Muslim minority, which is close to 200 million? which is second largest Muslim, which makes us second largest Muslim country in the world after Indonesia. Well, you know, if you, there was a committee appointed by the government a uh, few years back known as Satcher Committee. And Satcher Committee gave its report on the socio-economic and political status of Muslims in India. If you remember uh, the year 2002, and there's a state in India called Gujarat, where we had the Hindu right wing nationalist, nationalist government. That would be the Bharatiya Janata Party, 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 Party. BJP. Yeah, yeah. And you know about 2002 riots against Muslims. I was referring to major sources of violations. The first source was terrorism and anti terrorism. So you had this train bogey going into Gujarat, and 58 Hindus were burnt alive by some miscreants uh, in that bogey. Then the in, in the train. In the itself, train, yeah. in the train itself. Then the riots that broke out after that. You had that saw about uh, the numbers, you know, the figures are contested, but over 200, 2,000 people uh, killed Muslims. Massacred. Massacred. A state sponsored massacre. The BJP, the right wing government was supporting. Now, you had this anti terror law, POTA, that time, which is now repealed. It is known as Prevention of Terrorist Activities Act. It was repealed by the, by the UPA government, which is right now in power under tremendous pressure from civil society and other organizations. Now, under this law, about 12 or 1400 people were charged under this law, POTA. You had all of them Muslims. There was only one non-Muslim and that was a Sikh. Mm. So you had a, an anti-terror law which was used against one community there. 12 or 1400 people, only one was a non-Muslim and he was a Sikh, even he was not a Hindu. So if you just talk about numbers, you know, you had 58 Hindus killed and you had over 1000 Muslims killed. But you have 1200 Muslims charged under POTA, not a single Hindu. Mm. That, that law is not repealed. Similarly, in 1984, our Prime Minister was shot down by Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi was, and uh, you had massive killings of Sikhs. Sikh is a community, the, with the uh, turbans, religious community the turbans and beards. in India. Mm -hmm. TADA, there was another law in force that time, which was known as TADA, Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Law. That was massively used against Sikhs that time. So you have these laws where you know they're being used, and that speaks of how we are treating, how the state is treating our minorities. Uh, my organization and other groups, we keep organizing people's tribunals um, after such 
massacres and killings and you have this or after every bomb blast in New Delhi, in Bombay, everywhere after every bomb blast it's almost a ritual that you have members of a particular community picked up by the police Muslims primarily, Muslims primarily. Mm -hmm. they confess to the police under torture police is straight confessing to police uh, under certain laws in the past was admissible in the court of law and many people are persecuted on confessions alone you know and police is brutal in India it's, it's a colonial uh, legacy even colonial police are better actually I'm afraid we're running out of time so we just have uh, 30 seconds what are the prospects for the Maoists seizing power in some of these areas where they're operating in, in India? Can't say it is a difficult question I do not think that right now um, um, there are any chances uh, and, but I would say that you know it is not important whether they are Maoist or, or any other group the, the unrest is so much you know the dispossession, displacement, poverty there is so much of violence against the poor, against the Dalits, against the tribals in India that they would go for any group so you have Maoists in that part, you have other problems see the problem is that Maoists are noticed because they resorted to violence and media is telling us that they are there but there is a whole broad spectrum of resistance movements across India right from non-violent Gandhian to socialist and many other ways of, of resistance which nobody knows about so Maoists are just the one part of it which are being talked about because they resorted to violence and because the Prime Minister of India says that they are the single largest threat to the security of the country but there are many other groups I come from Tehri and Sundaral Bahubuna, a Gandhian was resisting and I am part of that movement for 30 years, Namada movement for 30 years, nothing happened. They tried to exhaust every constitutional uh, space, you know, going to court, non-violent protests, Delhi, let us, everything, nothing happens. When Maoists pick up gun, they are noticed. My guest has been Harsh Dobal. Thanks very much for joining us, Harsh. Thank you very much, David. For Deep Dish Thank TV, you. I'm David Barsamian. See you next time. Two minutes? Yeah. Two minutes? Okay. So we just have two minutes yeah. left. Okay. In 2006, in neighboring Nepal, there was a successful uh, Maoist revolt uh, that effectively uh, overthrew the uh, government and replaced the last, well, the only uh, Hindu monarchy uh, in the world. What is the connection, if any, between the Maoist movement in Nepal and in India? See, first of all, Nepal was a different context. There was a struggle against monarchy. In the, and as I said before, in India, Maoist resistance is not the only form of resistance. Let us keep that in mind. Having said that, um, you know, in India, again, there are different, different versions of Maoism. There are different versions of Naxalism, unlike in Nepal. And Nepal is bordering certain states of India. For example, one is mine, Uttarakhand. So there could be some there, but I, I, I think that the issues are slightly different and Nepal was a different context, different political fight, uh, it's a different, uh, it was a different uh, ball game altogether. And India is different, India as I said, India has diverse range of resistance movements going on, Maoists one and the support that Maoists are getting is not the support from the hardcore cadre, many of them don't understand. Uh, so. I think it would be a little too much you know, going overboard to make a direct comparison between the two. And just one quick uh, question uh, on Kashmir. Uh, there has been again uh, another uprising there. This has been ongoing since 1947, particularly since 1989. Uh, what is the situation there in terms of uh, human rights and who are the people that are resisting? The Indian government says it's Pakistani inspired. Kashmir is, a, is an evergreen wound which is very meticulously being kept green for, for a very long time now. Last two, three summers if you notice, if Indian government is saying fine there could be some groups which are being sponsored and there are of course which are being sponsored and funded by Pakistan but if you see now in Kashmir, if you see the latest trend, you have thousands and thousands of young people out on the streets throwing stones. You have women who have given up their traditionally assigned jobs and coming out on the streets openly. So there is this simmering content, discontent and anger which is finding uh, expression and which is being manifested out in the streets. I think if you closely read the situation in Kashmir today, I think people are not joining those 
armed groups. You cannot have whole uh, huge population being funded by Pakistan. You may be having some groups, but today the reality is different. A new generation has come down on the street and they are not going to give up and they are not, I do not think that they are going to join these militant groups. They are looking for justice which they have been denied for very, very long time. They do not relate to what is known as justice even in, in, in and, the rest of the country. And is justice independence for Kashmir? Uh, well, it's a complex question. In the beginning it was different, now it is different. But I think with the course of time, if you go to the streets of Srinagar, everybody is chanting Azadi, Azadi. Azadi is freedom. Freedom from what? That is the question. I think more than the question of freedom and Azadi, it is basically the longing and the absence of justice. You know, which which they have not seen in many years. There is this whole generation of young Kashmiris that have grown under the shadow of gun in, in turmoil situations, and uh, and they don't. Well, it's a heavily militarized area. There are probably more uh, per capita Indian security forces in Kashmir than half a million troops. Any place in the world, yeah. Half a million troops. Mm -hmm. So you know, we India tries to sell to the world that look, we have democracy there. We started elections. India tries to tell the world that look, there is no militancy has been contained. Uh, we try to tell the world that look, last time there was a huge, uh, you know, turnout and people voted in elections. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, if you look at the military persons alone, army is supposed to fight an enemy. Why do we have half a million troops there? That makes it one of the most militarized zones in the world and this number of troops is more than what the United States sent to Iraq or Afghanistan. Combined. Combined. It's, it's much more than that. So, you know, it's like double standard, double speak. How can you call it a democracy? How can you call it an integral part of India when you have so much of military to control them, number one, and so many people out on the streets every day? Thanks very much, Hirsh Dubal. Thank you very much, David. Pleasure being here. For Deep Dish TV, I'm David Barsamian.